crank that down. All right, today there was a video to this. So again, this I made it as one big PowerPoint. It's chapters 11 and 12. Everything in chapter 11 I recorded that was its own separate lecture recording. I don't know, it was like 50 some minutes, something like that. Uh, and that's, everything in PowerPoint is all about controlling microbial growth. Since we've already gone, what are the, some of the things they need to make them happy, certain temperatures, pH, things like that. This whole PowerPoint is the reverse. It's what are things that we can do to kill them? What are things we can do to stop them from growing? Chapter 11, which was his own separate recording, what are different ways we can stop microbes from growing out in the environment? Can we use certain types of temperature, um, cold, heat, to stop microbes from growing? Can we remove water? Can we use certain types of chemicals? Can we use certain types of pH or salt? You know, what are all the things to stop them from growing out in the environment? That was its own separate recording, so if you haven't watched that, watch that. The chapter 12, this is what are ways we can stop microbes from growing in the body. Because again, how we can stop microbes from growing out in the environment is completely different than how we can stop microbes from growing in the body. Because again, we can spray bleach all over tables, we can't inhale bleach or drink bleach. Um, we can change the temperature, you know, we can heat up certain surfaces to kill organisms, we can cool things down, we can't change our body's temperature. Um, so, whole nother different way of controlling microbial growth once in the body. Specifically talking about what are all the antimicrobial drugs that we can take and how do uh, the different classes of antimicrobial drugs work. Oh, I have this working. So in the PowerPoint, let's see if I can, there we go. Uh, we're gonna go over just what are some terms when we're talking about different types of antimicrobial drugs. How do they work? So that's the mechanism of action. How do the different antimicrobial drugs actually target these different organisms? What are some considerations and which, which drug do we choose? And then of course, what's happening now is resistance to antimicrobial drugs. As the more we use them, the more we lose them. So I put in like my little definitions um, in blue up here. So you probably don't have them on your problem. I don't think I included it. But just some terms when we're talking about different things, different types of antimicrobial drugs, just first is, well, what is a drug? So a drug is a very generic term. It's any chemical that affects physiology, meaning how your body is working in any manner. It's very generic. We're talking, this can be over-the-counter drugs. This can be illegal drugs. And I'm like, it's something that's gonna affect your body's physiology and how it's working in some manner. And today we're not gonna focus on, you know, any illegal type drugs or over-the-counter drugs or cancer drugs. Um, again, those are all very unique and specific. We really want to start looking at what are chemotherapeutic agents and even all the way down to antimicrobial agents. So chemotherapeutic agent is a drug that acts against a certain disease. But cancer itself is technically a disease and we have drugs that can treat cancer. And we're not talking about those. And I'm like, we really are trying to narrow down not just any drug that, you know, a uh, that targets any disease, we specifically are looking at antimicrobial agents, so drugs that are targeting microbes, whether they're bacteria, whether they're viruses, whether they're some type of parasite, fungus, but we're looking at some type of drug that's gonna target microbes, so living organisms in the body that are causing some type of disease. So we don't care about the cancer treatments or any other types of dementia treatments and drugs. We're specifically looking at drugs that are targeting microbes growing in the body. Now, of the ones that are treating and killing microbes in the body, we do group them into antibiotics, which although generally when we talk about antibiotics, we're like, ah, oh, it kills bacteria. But antibiotics is a pretty generic word. It just means anything against something living that's truly where the name came from. And they usually are referred to as killing bacteria. But an antibiotic just means something that kills something that's naturally produced. So something that's found out in nature that we know can kill some other type of organism. Fungus, penicillin came from the fungus penicillium. 
That's a fungus, and I'm like, and it naturally stops and inhibits microbes, bacteria, from growing. So it is a naturally produced, it's antibiotic. Naturally produced antibiotics out there are, you know, we're kind of finding most of them already. That there's not a lot of new antibiotics out there. So what we are doing is we're taking a lot of those antibiotics and we're altering them just a little bit. So they're called semi-synthetic. So they, we took a naturally producing antimicrobial drug out there, like penicillium, and then we change it a little bit. We can get in there and genetically change it. Maybe it's to make it last a little bit longer in the body. Maybe it's to make it so your immune system doesn't recognize it and have an allergic reaction to it. Maybe it's so that I can be a little more effective on a few more types of bacteria. So we're taking those naturally found antibiotics and we're tweaking them. Then you have semi-synthetics. A lot of times if you're allergic to an antibiotic, like penicillin, you're usually allergic to all the semi-synthetic derivatives. Like amoxicillin actually comes from penicillin. It's a semi-synthetic that came from penicillin. It's its own separate one, but they are derived. So a lot of times if you're allergic to one, you're allergic to the other. Not always though. And then synthetics, as we're running out of new drugs, these are fully made antimicrobials made in a lab. So we're not taking something found out in nature, we're just totally creating new antimicrobials in the lab. Now, the how they work is the mechanism of action. And again, we want our antimicrobials to be what is known as selectively toxic, which means we want it to kill what we want it to kill, but we don't want it to harm us. We don't want it to harm our normal flora if we can avoid it. It's not always avoidable. But we want it selectively toxic, toxic to some things but not to others, specifically us. The PT is patient. We have antimicrobials that target bacteria. So again, their job is to kill bacteria, but really not harm anything else. We have some drugs that are target eukaryotic infections, specifically fungal infections and parasites, because those are eukaryotic organisms. There's a lot less of those than compared to the antibacterial. And then we have antiviral drugs. So again, they're all selectively toxic. They're toxic for those unique organisms and hopefully not toxic to anyone or anything else. But our biggest class of drugs truly are antibacterial. We have much more antibacterial than we have antiviral or anti-eukaryotic. And again, the mechanism of action is gonna be a large chunk of the next slides coming up, is how do those different antimicrobials work? And we're really gonna focus on the antibacterials, the ones that are trying to kill those bacteria. There's different classes of antibiotics, antibacterials, and it's just how do they kill? What is their mechanism of action? So, different mechanisms of actions, which this, this little intro slide leads into like, I don't know, my next like 12 slides or something. Uh, when they talk about classes of drugs, we're talking about how do they work. For example, this class of drugs inhibits cell wall synthesis. So it's targeting those peptidoglycams, the NAMs and the NAGs that assemble to make the cell wall. This class of drugs inhibits protein synthesis in bacteria. This class of drugs inhibits the cytoplasmic membrane, so the cell membrane of the bacteria. This class of drugs inhibits metabolic pathways so that it can't make its end product. And if a bacteria can't make its end product, it won't survive. We have a class of drugs that inhibits the making of DNA or RNA, depending on what the particular organism needs. And we have a class of drugs that inhibits the attachment. So it's altering the attachment site. So bacteria can't attach to cells, or certain other organisms can't attach to cells. So when we talk about class of drugs, we're talking about what are the different mechanisms of actions. Now, it does give examples of some of the drugs underneath the different classes. Which group, which mechanism of action, which group do you actually recognize some of the antibiotic names? Because I'm guessing you recognize some of the antibiotics that are listed up there as examples. But which group, which mechanism of action do you actually recognize the most number of antibiotics? 
cell wall synthesis, that top one, that first one I said. And I'm like, you've probably heard of penicillin or vancomycin or bacitracin. Mike, even ointments can have bacitracin in it. Um, these are all very common antibiotics. They're sometimes kind of our first antibiotics we try to go for. And part of that reason is because it targets the cell wall specifically, will that interfere with our cells? Do our cells have cell walls? No. Our cells have cell membranes. Our cells do not have cell walls. And even if they did, like plant cells have cell walls, they are not made of peptidoglycan. Because this class of drugs specifically targets the cell walls and our cells don't have cell walls whatsoever, the drugs generally have very low side effects. Which again, is one of the things we would like. We don't want to give antibiotics to someone and then they get sick from the antibiotics. They're already sick. And so a lot of times it is a kind of our first group of drugs that we tend to go for just because it's so unique and so specific just to those, that one specific part of the bacteria. So it's the most common, inhibiting bacteria cell wall. Most common group. Again, they work because they stop that peptidoglycan formation. They stop the NAMs and the NAGs from assembling. Again, the NAMs and the NAGs, those are the bricks that form the wall. Now, the group name is called beta-lactams. So the class of drugs that inhibit cell wall synthesis are called the beta-lactam drugs. Again, you guys are, most of you are gonna have to take pharmacology and you're gonna learn all that again. But we're gonna talk. Some bacteria are getting smarter and are figuring out ways of, away, you know, from getting affected by these different antibiotics. But if you're a bacteria and you can't assemble the NAMs and NEGs together to form a wall, you now have a very weak wall. Again, if I was gonna make this building and I got a whole big pile of bricks and I started to assemble them, I would wanna put mortar between them, I'd have a nice strong wall. But if you can't put mortar between them, or maybe you're missing a few bricks, you've got a very weak wall and those bacteria are gonna die. i give some examples that are listed in there. For example, these are the NAMs and NAGs, that they're assembled to each other left to right, top down, even front to back. But these drugs stop those attachments. So again, it's for putting the bricks together, but no mortar, nothing that actually holds the bricks together. And if you don't have those attachments, like these little green parts that, if they don't attach to each other, you have a very weak, weak wall. I could go over and just push the wall over. Well, they're not worried too much about somebody pushing it over, but osmosis, water can expand and it can just easily break that wall. And so bacteria truly explode uh, based on osmosis or even implode just because they don't have a very strong wall. They don't have that mortar between all the NAMs and NAGs. Now, just more examples. Again, some semi-synthetic derivatives. So again, penicillin is kind of that original antibiotic, but methicillin, amoxicillin, ampicillin are all penicillin, but tweak, you know, just tweaked a little bit in a lab. Other types that can even work more specifically on the cell walls, uh, vancomycin and cycloserine are specific for gram-positive cell walls. That very, very thick cell wall, they interfere with its assembly. Bacitracin works not by inhibiting uh, the mortar, so it's not preventing those little cross-links or those attachments from forming, but it just prevents nebs and negs from ever leaving the cytoplasm to go form the wall. So it's like they just make it so there's no longer any bricks to make a wall. And isoniazide and ethambutol, they disrupt mycolic acid. You remember, some gram positive have mycolic acid. Mycolic acid is really a lipid. These are the acid fast bacteria, that mycobacterium genus. So it specifically targets that particular part of the assembly of the cell wall. Another class of drugs inhibits protein synthesis. Now, specifically when we're making proteins, it goes through transcription and translation, and we're gonna have like a little mini unit on genetics. Uh, but it goes through transcription and translation. 
These drugs are specifically targeting the translation step. So DNA makes messenger RNA and transcription, but a ribosome has to read messenger RNA to make proteins and assemble amino acids. These drugs stop that from happening. They're really targeting the ribosome part of translation. And there's lots of different ways to do it. Like all of these different letters are different ways to do it. Some of them make incorrect amino acids come in. So it's not bringing in the right amino acid, which means it's not going to make the correct protein. Some make it that the transfer RNA that brings in amino acids can't attach, so then it can't bring amino acids in at all. Some make it that even though the amino acids get brought in correctly, they can't get attached to each other, which means you can't make a long chain of amino acids or your protein. Some make it so your RNA can't get pulled through the ribosome, which means you can't read it, can't make amino acids or assemble amino acids. Some make it so that the ribosome, which is two big blobs, um, can't even attach to the messenger RNA, or maybe only one part can attach. I mean, there's lots of different ways. Ult ultimately, whole class of drugs is somehow targeting the that ribosome so that it can't make proteins. Proteins are enzymes. Proteins are structural material. If bacteria can't make enzymes, if bacteria can't make their structural materials, they cannot survive. Another class of drugs, I feel like, do you have a different slide after this one? I thought I had another slide with examples and names. Okay, I was going to say, I'm like, I feel like I had this mixed around for a while and then I fixed it, but then maybe I didn't save the correct. Um, another class of drugs targets the cell membrane, the cytoplasmic membrane. This is the class of drugs makes or channels form in the cell membrane. And if you're a bacteria and now you have a hole, a channel, a pore, whatever you want to call it, you got a hole in your cell membrane, stuff can get in that shouldn't get in, stuff can get out that shouldn't get out. We'll talk later this semester about one specific uh, drug, amphotericin B, that targets the cell membrane. And it works that in the cell membrane, this targets fungus, because we're going to talk fungal infections later. This targets fungus, and in a fungal cell membrane, they have these big purple structures in the cell membrane called ergosterol, and the drug recognizes ergosterol in the fungus, and anywhere ergosterol is, that amphotericin B attaches and causes a pore or channel or a hole or whatever you want to call it to form. Ultimately, this will kill the fungus because the fungus will lose things out of the cell or stuff will get in that shouldn't. It can't regulate itself anymore and it will die. However, amphotericin B is great at killing fungal infections, but our cells have cell membranes. And although we don't have ergosterol in our cell membranes, we do have cholesterol in our cell membranes. And sometimes cholesterol and ergosterol can look a little too much alike that amphotericin B will sometimes see cholesterol and think it's ergosterol, and it will cause channels or holes or pores, whatever you want to call it, uh, to form in our cells. This is why amphotericin B is great as an antifungal, but it has to be given in very low doses because of side effects, and usually for a very long period of time. Bacteria don't have anything that, re that resemble cholesterol or ergosterol, so they're not affected by this particular drug. It is very selectively toxic to fungus, although it can be toxic to us as well. But we do have one drug, the polymyxin, that works on the outer membrane, because gram-negative bacteria have two membranes. Um, it works on that outer membrane of gram-negative bacteria. It's not usually the first drug that's picked. They're usually going to go with some other class of drugs um, because they can be toxic to our kidneys. But sometimes, you know, those drugs are running out and we're not left with a lot anymore. Another class of drugs inhibits metabolic pathways. And what I mean by that is that bacteria, they have a substrate. Eventually, they want to make an end product, so they take their substrate one. Maybe it was a little green circle. And using one enzyme, that little green circle turns into little red triangles. And using another enzyme, little red triangles turn into little um, yellow squares. And eventually, little yellow squares turn into some other colorful shape. 
Um, that's what the bacteria needs. Well, we've got drugs that can target different enzymes along the way so that the bacteria can't make whatever end product it is that they're making. And what's nice is because there are so many pathways for a bacteria to make their end product, like there's so many steps, there's so many different targets. We can have drugs that can target maybe enzyme one, we can have drugs that target enzyme two, we can have drugs that target enzyme three. As long as we stop the sequence anywhere along there, the bacteria can't make their end product. They can't make whatever it is that they need, ultimately they'll die. One thing we do have to worry about though is if, if this particular pathway and these enzymes are similar to what our cells need. So then we have to look specifically at what's a, what is a metabolic pathway that only bacteria use? What are enzymes that are specifically only used in bacteria and not in our cells? Some, some examples, aid of a quone interferes with electron transport. Any heavy metal is antimicrobial because it inactivates enzymes in general. However, High doses of any heavy metal can inactivate enzymes in us too. And then we also have drugs that block the activation, that there are steps that have to activate a virus to start to reproduce. We've got drugs that are targeting that particular pathway. If a virus can't be active, it won't start to reproduce in our cells. These are some of the antiviral drugs that we have, amantadine, fremantadine, and some different organic bases that we can use. More specific antiviral that targets the metabolic pathways is specific for HIV, the HIV virus. There is one very unique enzyme, actually, it has a couple of unique enzymes, um, but one unique enzyme that HIV needs is an enzyme called protease. Again, most enzymes end in ACE. HIV uses protease to begin activation for it to hijack and begin reproduction. If we can stop that particular enzyme, HIV can no longer become active. It can no longer reproduce. And you'll see HIV come up in some other unique areas, other classes of drugs. We've put a lot of money into HIV research and a lot of money into HIV drugs, and we've got a lot to show for it. It's taken us 40 years to get here, um, but we've got a lot of drugs that are very specific, and what's Nice is HIV has some very specific enzymes, and those are the ones that we are then targeting so that they don't interfere with our cells. We have a class of drugs that inhibit nucleic acid synthesis. I don't care that you know all the pictures on there. Um, when I talk about nucleic acid synthesis, that's the Na, nucleic acid, of DNA or RNA. So it is a metabolic pathway when cells need to make more DNA or need to make more RNA. And because it's a pathway, it's like a metabolic pathway, but it's specific for DNA or RNA, we know that you know, there are lots of enzymes that eventually make DNA or RNA. And there's more than this even. If we can target any of those enzymes, the bacteria can't make more DNA in replication. Viruses can't make more RNA in replication. Ultimately, you stop the bacteria and or viruses from reproducing is our cells need to make DNA. Our cells make various different types of RNA, and so we do have to find unique enzymes that DNA and or viruses, that bacteria and or viruses um, or fungus or other parasites use for us to start to use these. And so we do not have a lot of drugs on the market that target DNA or RNA. Most of the drugs that are inhibiting nucleic acid synthesis are usually used more in research and trying to like, you know, well, let's inhibit this one from growing so we can work with these guys. Um, but they're also starting to use it to slow cancer cell replication. If we can target the drug into a tumor and stop the tumor cells from growing and dividing by making new DNA and RNA, we can start to slow cancer cell replication. Another way this doesn't completely stop making DNA or RNA, but it makes bacteria make incorrect, or viruses make incorrect DNA. So it's not stopping the process, it's just 
making the process happen, but it brings in incorrect bases. Example, if instead of bringing in an A, it would bring in something that just looks like an A. Instead of bringing in a T when we're making DNA, it would bring in something that just looks like a T. They're called nuclear, nucleotide or nucleoside analogs. These are things that look like our nucleotide bases. They look like your adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine. They look like them, but they are not actually them. And if they get brought in instead of the correct nucleotide base, the adenine, the thymine, um, you're not going to make correct DNA. Example, I think I've got a big picture. If we've got, here are the basic nucleotides, your adenine, thymine, cytosine, guanine. Um, these are the actual structures. We have lookalikes that if you look at it real close, you're like, it looks the exact same. But it's not the exact same. But it's real close. And I'm like, we've got all of these different molecules that look close enough to those nucleotide bases that if they are now introduced into the body, your body will use, as it makes new DNA, some of these lookalikes instead of the correct base. And it makes incorrect DNA. And again, if we can inject these nucleotide analogs into a tumor, it assembles incorrect DNA, and we can hopefully slow um, cancer cell replication. This is showing just a couple other examples. Quinolones, fluoroquinolones act against prokaryotic bacterial DNA gyrase. It's an enzyme used in making DNA. We have some that it can inhibit RNA polymerase. That's the enzyme that's used in RNA. And we do have one group of drugs that inhibits reverse transcriptase. Again, it's inhibiting another enzyme. It again is only specifically used with HIV. So DNA to RNA, specifically messenger RNA, is, rever is transcription. HIV, when we get to viruses, we'll talk more about HIV. HIV is so unique, it has an enzyme called reverse transcriptase, which means it takes messenger RNA, makes double-stranded DNA from it. That's super unique. None of our cells do it. Nothing else does. HIV is like the only, not the only, one of the very few things that has that particular enzyme that can do this in reverse. And the enzyme that it's used, we can then target and we can stop HIV from reproducing. So again, we used to have no treatments for HIV whatsoever, and now we've got tons of drugs that can inhibit the virus from replicating, from being released from the cells, um, or pretty much keeping it at bay. Another class of drugs that's kind of our newest class of drugs, and this is more specific for viruses than bacteria, some bacteria, is it prevents attachment. So some bacteria do have to attach to surfaces. That's what forms biofilms, and we're working on that. But we also know specifically viruses have to attach to certain things on our cells so that certain viruses only attack certain parts of our body because they attach to something very specific on the cells that are found there. If we can stop a virus from attaching to a cell, it can't hijack that cell, which means it can't ever cause disease. Some if we can, you know, get, I expect in the next 20 years we're going to see a lot more, uh, or a lot more drugs in this class, because we don't have a lot of antivirals on the market. If we can stop the virus from attaching, we can stop diseases, any viral disease from forming. Now, some considerations. So there's a lot of classes of drugs, how they work. Again, when they talk about, oh, well, we, we're just going to switch different classes of drugs. It means we're targeting a different area. Maybe targeting cell wall didn't work. Now we've got to target the cell membrane or protein synthesis. But what are some considerations on which drugs do we grab? Which drugs do we start to use? So our ideal antimicrobial agent, this is what we, we ask a lot of our drugs. This is what we want our drugs to be. We want them to be readily available. I want to drive to Walgreens. I want to have it there. No issues. I don't want to have to wait. Um, I want it cheap. Your insurance company wants it cheap. Uh, we want it chemically stable. It's not going to break down quickly. It's shelf stable. Um, it's easily administered. Hopefully we just, you know, swallow a pill. Maybe if it's liquid and you can just drink it. We want it non-toxic, non-allergenic. You don't want to have any side effects from it. 
We want it selectively toxic against a wide range of pathogens, which means if I take some type of antibiotic, I would like it to kill multiple things that could be causing a, a particular disease. But we definitely want it effective against your patient's very specific organism. So we want, it, we want it effective against lots of things, but specifically we want it effective against whatever it is that you're taking that antibiotic uh, for. So we ask a lot of our antimicrobial agents. We want them cheap, easy, shelf stable, readily available, and we want them to work. Now, what they target and how many things they can target and kill depends on whether it's considered a narrow spectrum drug or a broad spectrum drug. A broad spectrum drug means it's effective against a large number of microbes. A narrow spectrum drug means it's very specific. It's got a very narrow grouping of organisms that it will even, be, that will, it will even work against. Some examples. So on the bottom diagram here, we group our bacteria into our mycobacterium. They have mycolic acid. <laughs> Gram-negative, gram-positive, and then chlamydias and rickettsias, because they're, they're just their own unique, odd bacteria group in itself. For example, erythromycin or tetracycline, these are considered broad-spectrum drugs. They're going to work against almost all gram-negative, all gram-positive, and even some of the unique gram they're positive, but some of the unique gram-positive bacteria. And I'm like, they work against a lot. Polymyxin is more of a narrow, a, a narrow spectrum drug. It's only going to work against gram-negatives. It's not going to work against gram-positives, and it's not even going to work against all gram-negatives, just some. So that's considered a narrow spectrum drug. Now, the question is like, well, why would you give a narrow spectrum drug like polymyxin when you could give, say, erythromycin or tetracycline or something else that's going to work against the gram negative as well as a lot of gram positives. The problem when we get into gram, giving lots of broad spectrum drugs is you're going to start to kill more bacteria than you want to kill. Do you guys have bacteria living in you and on you right now? Yep. Are they all bad? Yeah, and we'll eventually get to like all the good things they do for us. Um, we've got lots of bacteria that are living in us and on us. There are normal flora that do great, for, great things for us. But if you go in with an ear infection or a sinus infection, you go in, the doctor's like, oh, yep, tell me your signs and symptoms. Yeah, sounds like a sinus infection. Here's your antibiotic prescription. Or, oh, uh, yeah, yeah, it looks like an ear infection. Here's your antibiotic prescription. Did they gram stain anything while you were in that, that doctor's office? No. Did they have any idea what kind of bacteria is causing your sinus infection or ear infection? No, they're going to give you a broad spectrum antibiotic. And it's going to kill, hopefully, what you went in there for, but it will also probably kill some of your normal flora, which is one of the reasons why, if you've got a really good doctor or nurse practitioner or whoever you see, they're usually going to say, hey, well, while you're taking this broad spectrum, broad spectrum antibiotic to kill whatever's causing your disease, you should probably eat some yogurt. You we gram stain. Um, you should probably, you know, get some probiotics, you know, in your diet somewhere. Try to help recolonize some of your normal flora. Because when you kill your normal flora, other infections can start to take place. Your normal flora do great things for us. And if you kill them, you can have other repercussions. And the more bacteria you expose to broad spectrum antibiotics, the more opportunity you give those different bacteria to become resistant. So the more we use broad spectrum that are targeting, you know, just about everything, um, other bacteria become adapted to it almost. Uh, that if you do need that, back, that antibiotic to kill something because it got a little out of control, it won't work anymore. Which is probably some of my next slides coming up. Now, we also want to make sure we give the right dose. Well, how many milligrams of an antibiotic should we give? You don't want to give more antibiotic than necessary. Why give someone 1,000 milligrams when 10 milligrams would be enough? But we don't want to give someone 10 milligrams when they need 1,000 to actually kill the bacteria. So there are tests that we can run, and we'll do some of these in our lab this semester, that shows us what is the minimal amount, what is the minimal inhibitory concentration that will stop bacteria from growing. So like, what's the minimal amount that we can give someone that will actually work? 
And there's a couple different ways we can do that. One is called the E-test. There is this strip of paper that is soaked in one type of antibiotic, but at different levels. So at the very top, I don't know if this is in milligrams, um, but I'll say it's got 250 milligrams per whatever ratio at the top. At the very, very bottom, 0 0.016. Well, we know we can grow bacteria on the plate. And we know at levels that are way up here, 256, yeah, it'll kill and stop any bacteria from growing. But even at a level of about 1 or 0.75, it's also stopping bacteria from growing. So why give someone 256 when a dose of 1 would work? But we also want to know we want to give someone a dose of 1 because, you know, 0.015 is not going to do anything. You know, so there's different ways we can test different levels of antibiotics to know. Because we don't want to say, well, we gave them that antibiotic and it didn't work, but maybe we just didn't give them a high enough dose. So there's different tests we can do to know what is the minimal amount that we know it will be effective against a patient's bacteria. And then there's, well, how are we giving these different antibiotics? There are some antibiotics that are topical. You can get antibiotic bacitracing cream. There's topical applications if you think you just have, you know, some type of surface infection. A lot of antibiotics are given orally. Some are, are given through an intramuscular injection, and some are given intravenous. It, the red lines show the difference between oral, intramuscular, and intravenous based on if we're given the same amount of drug, how much of the drug and how long does it take to get into your bloodstream. So this is looking at it takes a lot longer for an oral antibiotic to get into your bloodstream versus speed of intravenous and intramuscular. And even look in the amount of antibiotic that gets into your bloodstream compared to intramuscular or intravenous is a whole lot lower. Even though it takes longer for oral antibiotics to get into your bloodstream and less makes it into your bloodstream, oral antibiotics are still the most commonly given prescription for antibiotics. Why are oral antibiotics given much more frequently than intramuscular injections and intravenous? Because my guess at some point in your life, you've probably had an oral antibiotic, but my guess is you probably have never had an intravenous antibiotic. Why are oral antibiotics so much more common? Easier. Cheap and easy. And I'm like, which again, it's what insurance companies like to hear. Um, it's cheap and easy. It's not the most effective when we're talking about how much actually gets into your bloodstream, but it's cheap and easy, and if that cheap and easy method can work, that's always going to be the first way we go. But if someone comes in with a very severe infection that we're like, we need faster antibiotics into that bloodstream, and we need a, as high of a dose and a higher dose, then they might look in, depending on you know, how bad is the patient, how much do they need to get in, and how fast, that's when they're going to start to look at intramuscular injection and intravenous. But this requires you to be in the doctor's office. They generally don't send you with an intramuscular injection prescription. You're going to the doctor's office for that. This, you, if you've got intravenous antibiotics, you know, that's, you're admitted, you're, you are now a patient at the hospital. You are now admitted if you have an intravenous antibiotic, which means that's going to be very costly uh, for insurance. So they don't love it. So this is always the fastest, quickest, cheapest, easiest route. But for more severe cases, then you'll look at intramuscular and intravenous to get those antibiotics in. Now, there are also issues, there's always issues with taking any type of drug, putting any foreign anything in your body. There's always a possibility of some type of side effects. So we want to know what kind of side effects might it have. Is it going to have any toxic side effects, uh, mostly kidneys and livers, because that's where the, all the blood is going to get filtered. And if you now have antibiotics in your blood, is it going to cause any kind of damage to those organs? We also want to know if you're a pregnant female, are you going, is, is the certain drug going to have any adverse side effects to a developing fetus? So we want to know, are there other side effects? Do I need to worry about it being toxic? Are there going to be any type of allergic reactions? How many of you have an allergy to, a, to some type of antibiotic like penicillin or amoxicillin? Like a good number, like probably 25, 30% of you. Um, it's not uncommon. 
Again, you are putting something foreign in the body and your immune system will recognize it as foreign, which means it's gonna have some type of reaction. Now, when I say rare, or I'm talking rare is going into full anaphylactic shock, where you then need the EpiPen. Normally it's rash, fever, kind of red itchy, is that you're having some type of reaction to that antibiotic. And then they're just like, okay, no worries, we probably have a semi-synthetic derivative or we'll just switch to a different class of drugs. We also then want to know, how is it going to affect your normal flora? Is it going to kill all your good bacteria? You have good bacteria. They're good for a reason. Your bacteria, your normal flora, are sometimes our first line of defense for our immune system, preventing other bacteria from causing infections. Because bacteria, before they can cause an infection, they have to find a home, and then they have to start to reproduce. But if other bacteria are already there, your normal flora, new foreign bacteria don't have a place to live because it's already colonized. But if you kill them all, now it's like a free market for any foreign bacteria, pathogenic bacteria to call a home and start to reproduce. It causes what's known as secondary infections. And one of the most common secondary infections, C. diff. A lot of people have C. diff as part of their normal flora. It could be in your intestinal tract right now. What's nice though is you have so many other bacteria living in your intestinal tract, good bacteria, that can keep this bacteria under control. Whereas this bacteria wants to reproduce, the other bacteria in your digestive tract are like, nope, there's only so much room for all of us, you know, that we all have to live here and share a space. But if you kill your normal flora, and these clostridium endospore, not easy to kill, if you kill all your normal flora, these guys start to grow uncontrolled. And so a lot of C. diff infections are secondary infections that occur after taking a broad spectrum antibiotic, because you killed your good bacteria, making you more likely to pick up another infection. And then all the fun of everything is becoming more resistant. Uh, the bacteria are getting smarter as we are starting to develop different antibiotics and semi-synthetics, the bacteria are figuring out ways around it. Now there's different ways on how they're developing the resistant. Some bacteria, they're just naturally resistant and they've always been to certain classes of drugs. I don't remember, I think I've got another slide somewhere. Uh, but there are some bacteria that are completely resistant to the beta-lactam class of drugs. And it's because they make an enzyme called beta-lactamase that just breaks down the drugs. So the whole class of drugs that targets the cell wall, there are some bacteria that make an enzyme that just break that drug down. So you can just keep taking the drug and the bacteria just keep breaking it down and it does nothing. They were born with that enzyme, just a natural resistance. Some start to develop resistance. One, natural selection. And this can happen as you expose more bacteria to more antibiotics. For example, I'm not artistic and I don't plan on showing it. I don't know, there's like, I'm not counting, 12 bacteria up there. If you take a broad spectrum antibiotic to kill these guys, you know, whatever they are, my little X's up there, hopefully, you start to kill those antibiotics. You take your full prescription, you killed those bacteria, but the problem is your normal flora have also been exposed to that same antibiotic and you may not have killed all of them. And I'm like, you know, your job was to kill those pathogenic bacteria, but your normal flora, you probably killed a whole bunch, but maybe you didn't kill them all. Who survives? What's so unique about that one? Who survives? The resistant one, the one that, for whatever reason, something about them is a little bit different. You know, we call the strong survive, but strong how? Um, they've got some kind of a resistance to it. And guess what that one bacteria is gonna do? It's gonna reproduce, that's what bacteria like to do. And now all of your normal flora now 
have a resistance to an antibiotic. And again, normal flora should be good bacteria, but we'll talk later on how they can go rogue. Um, but now you start to have bacteria that are becoming resistant to antibiotics when they never used to be. The more you expose bacteria to antibiotics, the more likely it is you kill the weak ones and the strong survive. And they slowly over time just develop a natural, like, natural selection resistance. They're slightly changing to become more and more resistant. Some, we saw this in the video with the hunting the nightmare bacteria, is they have resistant plasmids. The NDM1 gene that David got in India, that's a gene, which means it's a little snippet of DNA that codes for antibiotic resistance. And so they're called R plasmids or resistance plasmids. And if this bacteria has that little bit of resistance plasmid, that little bit of DNA, it can jump from one cell to another cell, making other bacteria now resistant. This isn't a natural selection strong that will survive. It's, there are genes that code for resistance that can jump from one cell to another. So bacteria are getting these genes and they're developing this slight resistance over time to certain antibiotics. Now, other than just picking up a gene that makes them antibiotic, some bacteria will start to make an enzyme that destroys or deactivates a drug. Again, beta-lactamase. An enzyme, enzynase, literally is an enzyme that targets the whole class of drugs that target the cell wall. Some bacteria Again, that drug has to get inside the cell to kill it. Some bacteria figured out ways to slow down that drug getting in the cell. Some are now altering the target of the drug. The drug may have to recognize something specific on the cell. Maybe there's a little protein receptor that that drug has to recognize to know what it's targeting to kill. And it can, argue, it can, it can alter that little protein receptor. If the drug can't bind, can't kill the cell. Some metabolic chemistry. So I had before, you know, your substrate one through some enzyme became substrate two, another enzyme, it became substrate three, and another enzyme, it became substrate four. We have drugs they stop this enzyme. It's the whole metabolic pathway. If we stop this enzyme, in theory, the bacteria can't make their end product, they'll die. Well, the bacteria are like, okay, you're gonna stop that enzyme. They're like, we'll just make another enzyme. We'll call it enzyme like 1.5, and then it will make that substrate too. It's altering their own metabolic pathway. It's like, well, you wanna stop that enzyme? We'll figure out a way around it. And eventually they make their end product. So they're figuring it out. Some just pump the drug out. Oh, the drug gets in the cell. They have little protein pumps that just pump the drug right back out. And any bacteria that can form biofilms, its strength in numbers, are naturally gonna be resistant to antibacterial, some antimicrobials. And then we have to be worried about, as bacteria now become resistant to lots of things, we now call them superbugs. And there's like so many pictures. I was like trying to find pictures to put up. Um, for us to consider something a superbug, it has to be resistant to at least one class of drugs. Meaning it's resistant to all the drugs that target the cell wall. Or it's resistant to all the drugs that target the cell membrane. So it's resistant to a whole class of drugs. It still is treatable. MRSA is methicillin resistant staph, I don't want to write the whole thing, staph aureus. That's where the MRSA comes from. It is resistant to methicillin. It's not even resistant to the whole class of drugs, but it's getting pretty close. If it's resistant to methicillin, it's resistant to a lot of other drugs in that class. So we do call MRSA a superbug. That doesn't mean it's not treatable. People have MRSA all the time. 
we still have antibiotics that can treat it. Less, because we've eliminated almost a whole class, but we still do have antibiotics that treat it. Our fear is, will it keep evolving and becoming more and more resistant to other classes of drugs? Again, the R plasmids is how a lot of different bacteria are becoming resistant to more and more classes of drugs. It's that resistant plasmid. My example, the NDM1 gene from the video. Hospitals and nursing homes are the breeding grounds of antibiotic resistance. Because you put a lot of sick people in the same area. And lots of antibiotics are given in those areas. So you're pretty much putting lots of bacteria, and only it takes one bacteria that's you know has an R plasmid, a resistance plasmid. And I'm like, but you've got lots of sick people, lots of different types of bacteria, lots of possible resistance plasmids, all in the same area, and lots of antibiotics given where resistance can form, or the breeding grounds of where antibiotic resistance happens. Multi-drug resistant pathogen means it's resistant to at least three classes of drugs, which again is really narrowing it down because most of the common drugs that are given, it's cell walls, cell membranes, and proteins. And if you're resistant to those three, we're getting into very, very little bit left. And then cross-resistant, also known as pan-resistant, meaning these are organisms that are resistant to everything we have on the market. And if you're resistant to everything we have on the market, there's nothing we can do. You know, we try to improve their immune system and hope their immune system can take care of it, but they're probably not because you probably blasted their immune system uh, with something. And those are the ones we're most concerned about. Um, and I expect even in the next 20, 30, 40 more years, while you guys are all going to be in the healthcare field, we're going to have more and more cross-resistant organisms where you're going to have patients come in and you're going to have to explain to them, as you guys are going to nursing, you're going to be on the bedside, we don't have anything to give you. We have nothing. Um, because it's become resistant to everything we have, and there's not a lot we can do. Although I should say we're getting, we're getting clever. There's, there's other ways. There's not just drugs these days. Um, we're trying to, trying to figure out a way around this. So different ways we can slow resistant. We can't stop it. There's no way we could stop antimicrobial resistant because we're still giving out antibiotics, and just natural selection happens. So we can't stop it, but we can slow down resistance so that hopefully we can develop drugs faster than bacteria can develop resistance. One is we maintain a high concentrations of drugs when they're given. The idea is, I'm like, if I draw my 12 bacteria up there again, you want to maintain the highest concentration to kill all 12. You never want that one remaining. So if you're given a prescription, because I think this goes into my next one, two. Um, when you're given a prescription for a sinus infection or ear infection or whatever infection you guys have had recently, normally it's, you know, okay, take this for 10 days, you know, three times a day or whatever it is, for 10 days, 14 days. Does it take 10 days for you to start to feel better? No. What day is it normally? Two or three? You know, and you're like, oh, I'm fine. But that's because in the first two or three days, you know, maybe you had those 12 bacteria or whatever they were, and you killed most of them. And you're feeling a whole lot better because you killed most of the bacteria. You know, maybe each dot represents like a billion. Uh, you killed most of them to the point you're feeling better. But did you kill them all? No, which is why you still need to finish out the full prescription. Because the ones that you haven't killed in the first couple days to make you feel better are the ones that are kind of resistant. They're a little harder to kill. And you want to kill them. Because I'm like, if you don't kill them, they're going to do what they want to do, and they're going to reproduce. So it's maintain that high concentration, kill them all. Um, that might even mean take a combination of drugs. Maybe penicillin's not enough to kill them all. You know, they're all kind of harder to kill. Maybe it's penicillin mixed with some other type of antibiotic. But the idea is that you need to maintain the high concentration, kill them all. Because if you leave one behind, it's the most resistant one, and it will reproduce. And now all of them are resistant. And then... Don't use antimicrobials if you don't have to. It used to be, if you went to the doctor and said, I don't feel good, and the doctor's like, oh, well, you've got the flu, but they don't feel good, but they'll feel better, and they'll probably write me a better review if I just give them an antibiotic to walk out with. They don't do that anymore. 
I was happy, and I'm happy. It's sad that it still has to be up, but I was happy with like 10, 15 years ago that Gunnarsson finally started to put signs up in their um, waiting rooms and patient rooms that it's like, we will not give you antibiotics for a flu virus. And it's because patients still go in expecting, if I go to the doctor, I expect to walk away with an antibiotic prescription. But will an antibiotic cure the flu? <laughs> no. You'll feel better, warm and cozy. I feel better about it. No one wants to go to the doctor and say, we've got the flu and there's nothing we can give you. And I'm like, but we'll charge you 300 bucks for it, uh, for stopping in. They want to walk away with something. And it was very common. And it's, I'm not going to say it's stopped. Um, but it's become less common to give antibiotics uh, for virus infections. Now, my other note, there are some patients that still go in and get, that are diagnosed with the flu that will walk away with, a bacteria, with an antibiotic. Any guess why? And I totally approve of that. Any guess why some people still leave with an antibiotic when they have a flu? No, but we do have a couple anti-flu virus drugs that will reduce that. We'll talk a lot more when we get to viruses and the flu. The flu destroys your respiratory system, which makes you more apt to pick up a bacterial infection. And you guys, I assume, all healthy immune systems, you all are working. But if you have patients that are immunocompromised, elderly patients, if you destroy their immune system with the flu, they are more likely to pick up a bacterial infection. And so it's a preventative antibiotic. It's not to actually kill anything, it's to prevent people that have the flu from getting a secondary infection. It's the only time where I'm like, but I'm one of those, I'm like, but that patient had better be super sick and have a very low immune system to be walk away with antibiotics. Otherwise, now they're contributing to the cause of resistance. But the idea is don't take antibiotics unless you absolutely have to. Otherwise, we're trying to figure out new variations of existing drugs. So we're trying to come up with new antibiotics. That's becoming less common. But more new semi-synthetics, more synthetics, fully made in a lab antibiotic. Thank you so much.